get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm here with Justin Croxton. I'm going to introduce him formally in a second. Before I do, Justin, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out. You know, there's some cool ones that I've done. Um, One of my favorites is the co-founder of Pixar, and he talks about the crazy stories of starting Pixar. But some other ones, um, just a big shout out to Ian Garlic. Uh, We had one on goal setting, and you can check out his uh, website at videokstory.com. Jason Smith of Spotlight Social, um, who went from LAPD fighting gangs to digital agency owner. He's got some crazy stories there. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. Uh, you know, for me, Justin, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I always look at ways to give to my relationships, and I found no better way to do that than to profile the people and the companies I admire on my podcast, on my platform, and shout what they're doing, what they're working on, so they can share their knowledge. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you know have questions, you can go to rise25.com and email us. Both John and I, who started the company, have been podcasting for over 10 years, so uh, we know a little bit, so just ask us. I am excited. Justin Croxton is the CEO of Propellant Media. It's a geofencing marketing and advertising agency with offices in Atlanta and Charlotte. They serve, don't worry, we will talk about what geofencing is if you don't know what it is. Uh, they serve clients with location-specific methods like geofencing. Their clients are mostly small, medium-sized businesses in both B2B and B2C categories. And Justin, thanks for joining me. Oh, love it. Love it. Appreciate the intro. Greatly appreciate that. This is fun. I want to talk, you know, we'll get into uh, a couple of things, but um, just talk a little bit about, you know, because when you go to your website, people can go to propellant.media and it says leaders in geofencing marketing, experts in on the channel media, stewards of data targeting. So just give us a little sense about what propellant media does and, and what geofencing is. No, that's perfect. So Propellant Media, we were founded back in 2015, roughly, give or, give or take 2016 timeframe. And it, it many, many folks that are out there, when you're starting an organization, you're always trying to figure out how can I do something that's a little different than the rest of my competition? Everybody and their mom does AdWords, Facebook, SEO, website design. You know, I'm not saying that it is or isn't sexy, but it's, it's, there's not really a means of differentiation. Um, and so when we were founded back in 2015, 16 timeframe, you know, we had the opportunity to differentiate with this whole concept of geofencing advertising. For those who don't know, geofencing gives you the ability to serve ads to people in very precise areas. I mean, all the way down to the contours of the building. And so if you wanted to target, you know, if you were a car dealership and you want to target other car dealers, you don't necessarily have to build, you know, target folks within a zip code. You can actually pick your 10 car dealerships, build a virtual fence around those dealers and the customers that walk inside those fences, you can serve ads to them. And that's really how we differentiate ourselves to gain access to that technology. You got to be spending at least 30, 40 grand a month. In many cases, there are other platforms that have come out recently where, you know, maybe you don't have to spend as much, but the technology may not be as good. You know, for us, we've had access to some of the creme de la creme of technology, if that makes sense. And as a result, you know, that's how we've grown. But that's not the only thing that we do. We also do a lot of omni-channel advertising like the Google ads, you know, Facebook and Instagram and so forth. And so, you know, for us, we don't look at geofencing as the penicillin that's going to solve an organization's marketing problems. We think about how geofencing fits within that overall marketing scheme. And so that's why we say omni-channel media, leaders in geofencing, and then we leverage a lot of analytics and data to show um, how, how things are performing, such as walk-in visits from geofencing campaigns and such. Yeah. I want to walk through for scenarios so people kind of dig their teeth into what we're talking about. So we'll talk about a B2B example and a B2C example. Um, and there was a wood manufacturing place of all types of businesses. Yeah, yeah. How does that work with, with them? 
Yeah, great example. So, you know, we have a number of clients in the B2B space. This one was a wood manufacturer. They are, I mean, they are an international organization, not a huge budget, but something that's pr- relatively respectable. Um, they're the machines. They, they do like CNC routers, that kind of thing. And so normally, you know, they're going to be making not, these aren't just the CNC router that you sell at Home Depot. I mean, these are the big industrial size, industrial size ones uh, where they're going to go for 50 grand upwards of $500,000 per sale. Who are their type of, who are their customers? Yeah, exactly. Their customers are sort of the, 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 how you say this, the, the leadership in, 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 in not project management, but those individuals that oversee plant cabinet making, you know, companies. So it may be the CEO of that company. It also might be the production line manager, that person that makes those decisions. And so part of the goal for us is to, you know, get, get our message in front of those individuals. And so we had, you know, as I was mentioning, taking a more of an omni-channel approach to this, you know, we decided to do a few things. The first was to geofence a list of individual companies and those manufacturing plants that does a lot of the wood making, you know, um, like cabinets and things of that nature. So that was the first order of business, trying to get our message in front of those folks. There was an allocated spend just to that. And we would go into our tool. So those people would buy the wood from this company. So someone, a, a company would have a huge server or something like that, and they'd need to build a cabinet or some huge structure around that server. Yeah, it, it would. If you, if you look at it from the perspective of, I have to build a hundred cabinets and I'm building a hundred cabinets on a weekly basis. My existing, you know, CNC router is, is kind of old. Maybe it's 10 years old. It's not as advanced. Doesn't, you know, it's not as operationally efficient as the one that, you know, the brand that we represent is trying to sell into. And so that's where you're like, all right, you know, you want to book a demo with our team. You know, we want to get our message directly in front of those folks who are those production managers who's making those decisions. And we have a list of manufacturing plants that focuses on wood or machinery, not machinery, but metal and things of that nature. We have other things that they sell, but they are selling the actual machine that helps make and manufacture mm. the cabinets or other wood wood type products. Got it. And so part of what we would do is we would build virtual fences around the individual manufacturing plants, serve ads to the employee base, and try to get our message directly in front of those folks, more from an account-based selling perspective. Now, that again, that can't just be the only thing or the penicillin, as I mentioned, that's going to solve all your marketing problems. So when we say omni-channel, you have to include other aspects of digital. So maybe it is geofencing that has a line item for media spend. LinkedIn, obviously a really important one. Google ads, people who are in market doing a search for CNC routers. And, you know, you know, for CNC routers in particular, the, the tough part um, is you have people that are looking for that, the cheap you know, less than $2,000, $5,000 one. And you got folks that are looking for the, you know, $25,000, dollars $100,000 one. And so you have that challenge, but that's part of why you need to have an omni-channel presence rather than, oh, this one thing is going to save my organization or, you know, it's, you got to look at it from that perspective. And, and the reason why we say omni-channel is we look at not just how we've differentiated our organization with geofencing, but how it fits within the overall marketing scheme for any brand that we have that relationship with. I could see how that's very powerful from the leadership of that company that would buy this. What are they seeing on their end? So you're on your end. You're like, okay, we're geofencing these people where you have on the channel. What are they seeing on their end when they browse the web, when they're on their LinkedIn or Facebook or what do they see? That's a great question. So I'll take an stylized example for everyone that's listening. So imagine that we built a virtual fence around this location, right? And y'all are, you know, you're having a conversation with your buddy or your friend or whomever. And you say, oh man, what's the weather? You know, and you're already in the virtual fence, right? So we've captured your mobile device ID Mm. once you've entered the geofence location. And the moment that you open up your mobile device, say, oh, what's the weather? You scroll down and then you see the weather app. You click on that app. And then that's when you're able to see the ads for the company that's advertising to the individuals at that location. So if you think about 
many different types of apps that we have within our inventory. Angry Birds, Words with Friends, The Weather Channel, Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post, Fox News, CNN, et cetera, et cetera. We have well over- Common apps. Yeah. Apps. So it's not like you have to download a specific app in order to see the ads. Think of it like site retargeting. Wherever you go, we have the ability to yeah. serve that to you. Yeah. The, the, it's where what matters more is that we capture the audience. The audience is where you where you were physically, and we're saving that audience online to serve ads to you in real time for a period of time, essentially. Are more people not doing this because they're not aware of it, or it's because it may require a little bit bigger budget that people want to spend? What I think it's a mixture of both. Yeah. Um, I, I, I still believe that it's it's completely an untapped marketplace of individuals who could effectively be advertising or leveraging geofencing, geofencing marketing or programmatic display. Just so you know, programmatic is sort of like the umbrella that's the buying and selling of ads in real time. And geofencing fits within that bucket of programmatic display advertising for those that are out there wondering what that term terminology is. But it's really a mixture of both. But I know for sure there's a lot of people who just simply don't know about geofencing. Um, and, you know, they, they hear about it. They see that they hear like a car dealership say, oh, my buddy at this other GM was doing geofencing. It's been effective. Well, I, I did a Google search, you know, that kind of thing. There's a lot of people that aren't aware of it. Um, but there's a misnomer that you have to be spending you know, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars, um, which are great budgets depending on the type of company you are. But a lot of folks will also say, you know, think that oh, I can only spend a hundred dollars a month and that kind of thing on geofencing, and that's sort of ill-advised um, counsel. It's kind of like Google Ads; you're not really going to spend a hundred dollars on Google Ads. You're not really going to get the effect or the benefit of that. And so that's the that's the counsel in the the, the conversations that we have with brands all the time. Would it work in the scenario of a financial advisor? It could. B2B um, clients or? Yeah, we've had cases where we've had brands that are going to a conference. And, 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 here's, and here's the key. It's, it's, it still comes back to marketing 101. You have to think about the customer journey, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And there are certain channels that are a little bit more lower funnel, middle of funnel than others. And so for a financial advisor, they may say to themselves that, okay, I want to get in front of folks who are interested in my services, right? Something more along those lines. Um, Maybe those are people who have been to a conference. Maybe those are folks that are considering, you know, you know, other financial advisors, that kind of thing. You know, other than that, though, you know, I I may may not recommend, you know, geofencing for a financial advisor per se. Yeah. No, I love I I mean that I love what you just said actually because would it be possible uh, cuz I can see how this can apply to a lot of industries, right? So I did interviews at the Sweet and Snack show in Chicago, right? Big conference at McCormick Place. I'm wondering if people want to get in front of all of these um CPG companies. Um could they I don't know if it makes sense, but let's say there's like three or four of these type of conferences a year, does it make sense to do the geofencing for those particular, whatever, every quarter, or does it have to be done? Cause I could see, okay, cool. I could geofence this conference. Everyone who, from my limited understanding, knowledge from what you've explained, but I could see how they'd be powerful. Just let's say there's a CEO conference and this financial advisor wants to help more CEOs. That would be an example where they could use geofencing. That's a perfect example. And those are cases where, I mean, we have a lot of our business are, in fact, event-based campaigns hmm. where folks have been to a conference. We've done a few of them uh, actually in the past week uh, where folks went to a conference. Um, they want to get their message in front of all the attendees or a good chunk of the, int- the attendees. And we're capturing and saving that audience for serving ads both while they're at the conference and then saving that audience for future retargeting purposes as well. So we can retarget them for 30 days, whatever time frame mm. we appropriate. Um, and so that's definitely part of the yeah. course need to be examples with that particular stylized example of event-based geofencing advertising. Yeah. And then you could use that data to retarget later. So it's not like all is lost, like you don't capture them. It's like, great, I can now use this data on Facebook or Google or any other the the networks to retarget that? Yeah, that, that is the case. And, and to your point, and that's, again, this gets back to the omni-channel piece. 
Like if you're running a geofencing campaign, why wouldn't you have a site retargeting campaign already deployed? You know, you would have your Facebook pixel, your Google display, your Google ads pixel, your Instagram, Twitter pixel, your LinkedIn pixel, um, all of these other areas of site retargeting so that when someone clicks on your ad, then goes to your website, you are retargeting them and ultimately getting them to convert at some point or main, making sure that you're getting your brand in front of those folks, assuming that your average customer value is high enough and your ROI is there. Um, it's really a support and sort of an, uh, a blanketed umbrella effect. Um, and it's why we tell folks all the time, don't just focus on this one thing. You got to do a couple of things to really get everything churning the way that you would like. Yeah. And Justin, there's a lot, there's so many moving pieces to this. Now that you've done all of that, they hit your website and you just mentioned something of conversion. So what have you seen work as far as a B2B business for conversion purposes? You know, I know people have a demo or whatever. What have you seen that people yeah. should, can test out for that? What, what I think is, the, is, is really the best route to go. Um, and I even think about it for, for our brand, for Propellant Media, because everything that we recommend for our clients, we actually do it for ourselves. Um, and the first thing is just always trying to find ways to bring value to people, essentially, similar to, to your mantra and what you guys do over at Rise 25. And so when someone lands on your website, you know, have an ebook, have a video, have something that brings value, educational value, you know, monetary value, whatever it is, but true value to the person, but they have to, you know, leave some sort of contact details in order because you, you can't think from a b2b standpoint that someone's going to buy from you right then and there they got to kind of get to know you you know they got to they need to go on a couple dates they need to understand a little bit more about your organization same thing with geofencing if you think about it geofencing is really a b2b play in many cases like we're working with brands and folks and so you know someone that has expressed an interest in geofencing we, we unless they are ready right now we still need to nurture that relationship and so Things like pop-up forms, eBooks, mm -hmm. you know, white papers, you know, things that actually brings value to individuals. Like a lot of times when we're working with um, not financial advisors, but one that really just came to mind is like trusts and uh, and, and tax consultants, you know. But in the financial advise advising space, if you will, like one thing that I always say to folks is like, why don't you, you know, create a, a video series of like, you know, how you can, you know, save all this money. Um, for your for um, for your loved ones, or um, you know you know that you can put into a trust, like turn that into an ebook. I, I, so many folks that just don't do the simple blocking and tackling, you know, with that. Um, and a lot of times when you do those types of things, it makes folks more likely to subscribe to your YouTube channel or to you know download your ebook so you get their contact information you retarget them through your email automation and follow up so from a b2b standpoint i mean you know we we that's that's par for the course and there's a lot of great software out there we use hubspot as sort of our our tool of choice from a sales and marketing automation standpoint but you have some cheaper ones you got salesforce you got a ton out there that you can use um active campaign etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, I love what you said. I mean, it's really about bringing value. And in case in point, like if you go to propellant.media and you scroll down, they have download the geofencing guide, right? And so it's, you know, gives people information. There's a video there as well. So it's about bringing value because it also shows your authority in the space when they're learning, but it also displays your authority and, and you know what you're talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we talked about education. Um, before we hit record, and that's a huge mantra in your company for yourself. Um, and you, like you said, eat your own dog food here. And when we are talking about agency partners and educating partners, so talk about some of the ways you educate your partners. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. It's, um, it, it's really been a fascinating situation for us because when we were founded, we were getting a number of direct brands reaching out to us, car dealerships, higher education, restaurants, retail, you know, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. But then we were also getting a lot of agencies, marketing consulting firms, consultants that were in specific industries that heard about geofencing, 
but they didn't have access to, you know, to, or didn't have the ability to, to onboard that sort of a solution. Like they don't know the nuance of it, like, you know, how to, the strategy behind it, how to execute campaigns or even gain access to the technology by itself. And so for us, we said, well, we're not going to turn that business away. We're going to turn that into an entire partnership channel um, with, you know, our white label partners, our channel partners who essentially have, have an interest um, and not doing it all themselves, but having an organization that can essentially do it all for them. And so as we continued down that path, we realized that we had to bring, you know, you know, a little bit more of an education academy, if you will, for those partners. And so we developed um, the Propel Media Academy that folks can, you know, you have to become a white label partner. But once you're a partner, you gain access to the academy. The academy has an entire module that doesn't necessarily train our agency partners on like how to build campaigns, because that's what we're here for. We're here to, you know, take that heavy lift off of your off of their shoulders but rather how to be an effective media planner, how to gain more confidence in selling it, how to educate, how to incorporate as part of your media mix for other campaigns that you're running. Um, and, you know, we have everything from the education side of it to how to sell it. And then we also have a number of, um, you know, things like eBooks that clients can white label. Um, we have an OTT advertising over the top TV connected to advertising guide that you can white label an unbranded explainer video. Those are just ways that we've thought, how can we help an agency partner hit the ground running, right, with both content as well as, you know, material so that when you want to sell it or bring it as a solution to your clients, you can do it within quicker fashion while still having a respectable margin uh, for your organization as well. How do you get consumption of that? You know, they're, they're busy, you're busy. Um, how do you get them to actually consume it? Cause you know, when, once they consume it, it's valuable and they can use it. Yeah. You know, you know, one of the senior directors, uh, within our organization always says, I mean, everyone says this, but you know, you can, you can, you know, drag the horse to the water, but you can't force them to drink. Right. Um, the way that we try to, you know, get them to drink. Um, is by, you know, with our, not incessant, but our follow-up with, you know, our white label partners, just making sure that we're checking in with them, making sure that we're bringing some significant value to their lives. Um, and then making sure that the content that we've pro 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 provided prior to them gaining access to the Academy gives them enough incentive to say, okay, I see the potential here. Let me go ahead and ensure that my media planners, my account executives, even the agency owners have in fact consumed, you know, this content and, you know, you know, it's, it's, you know, we, we, we have on, we have a sub URL, an entire course. It's not like this is like in, in the cloud, you know, within like Google drive, it's actually a full blown course, but also other material. And we Making just try it easy to for that. people to consume it is a big thing too. It's, it's another yeah. course platform and it's similar to Udemy, but in this case, this is very specific to, content that we control um, that's within um, that's on our website at um, propellant.media. It's actually academy.propellant.media. Mm. So um, white label, what are some ways, because it's very valuable, you know, um, companies, like you said, marketing consultants, agencies, they're always looking for different revenue streams and their clients are demanding different things from them and they want to stick to what they're, they're tr what's tried and true for them, what they know, and they want to have someone who's an expert do the, the stuff that they don't know. So um, it's not necessarily easy to set up like a white label like you have. What are some mistakes or what are some things people should watch out for as far, if they're setting up like their own service separately as a white label for another agency or company? Yeah, you know, the, the, the one mistake that I see people make um, and it's just kind of what I've seen um, is really the, the first thing is the educational route. You have to have an educational uh, foundation that makes it simple for people to understand soup to nuts, you know, you know, from the very point in which, you know, they've engaged with a client all the way to the point of execution that there's full clarity in that process. Um, that is naturally going to be the question that you will get on every demo um, every single time effectively. Um, and even understanding the sub steps is critical, but not just for the client, 
but also for your internal team as well. So the academy that we've developed isn't just for our white label partners. There, as I said, you know, education is big here. It's also for our internal team as well. So we have courses that are specific to just our internal team. We also have courses that are specific to our white label partners. I think that's incredibly important. Um, the second mistake that I see folks make is just trying to get too greedy. You know, from a margins perspective, you know, they, I have some folks out there that try to charge you know, $15 CPM rates, that's just too high. You have to think about it. You know, the higher your CPM, the less um, in, in impressions um, that a client's able to get out of their media spend. And you got to look at it that way as well for yourself if you're going to white label. Um, even if you just create your own white label program for yourself. You got to leave room for growth for the company who's using it. Or what's the point of them doing it? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then the last thing, and this one, it can be a little difficult, but it, it's not to say that it's difficult. It's more so how do you do it in an organized fashion and you set time aside, which is just check-ins. It's simple as it sounds. Um, you know, that proactive I give a about your company needs to come off. And the way that you do that, quite frankly, is with your check-ins. You see how their business is going. Hey, what's going on? Even if it's just like a, a three minute loom video, just like, hey, man, let's we'll see what's going on. See how you're doing. You know, something that I noticed, you know, he was using this. I was thinking about you guys or, hey, I saw this was going on with this one client that I know that we're working with. Um, we made some optimizations. Just wanted to give you a heads up, blah, blah, blah. Those little touch points goes a long way because, you know, one of my partners, he always says that um, that. I don't, I don't, I can't say it the way that he says it, but, you know, clients really only care um, when you are showing up and when it comes to renewals and, you know, people, you know, you know, renewals for, for any, any business is not really just about the results. Like that may be 50, 60% of it, but the other 30, 40% truly is like, I actually like this person. They actually show that they care. Um, and in irrespective of the results, if you don't care, then, you know, folks are more likely to go in and work with someone else. And so you got to solve that piece and you solve that with the check-ins, with the follow-up with, and that's as simple as it is. It doesn't have to be yeah. an hour long call with each person. It can just be 15 minutes. Just want to say what's up. That kind yeah, of Yeah. It's a forming a real relationship with people and trying to, like you said, kind of going back to the same thing. If a potential customer or client hits a site is just bringing as much value as you can to them. The other thing I wanted to ask Justin is um, navigating partners, right? So you, it's not easy. I mean, it's like a marriage and it sounds like you have several partners in the business. Uh, yeah. Talk about having partners and then the different roles that you, you play in the company. Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy. Um, you know, I think that whenever, you know, even at least for us, I do believe that we've been lucky and that, that there's a certain level of integrity and culture um, that we've, you know, worked really hard to, uh, to develop here, you know, with the firm, um, you know, part of that is, you know, having an understanding of your operating agreements, you know, just little things like that. Um, but, you know, when you're trying to navigate that, those relationships, it's really, everyone knows what the goal is, you know, and, 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 and having just regular check-ins with your partners on a regular basis, like, Hey gang, this is what's going on. This is what we've done. This is what p &L looks like, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Um, and then also trying to ensure that, you know, if your partners are also officers and managers within the company, um, they have, you know, clear roles and responsibilities. Now, you know, that can be a little difficult sometimes when you're just starting out, cause you're just kind of trying to figure it all out, <laughs> you know, but There's a lot of overlap. A lot of overlap, you know, you know, you know, we're, we've ran into those situations where, you know, when you were first founded, you were both business development guy and the, the, the client delivery guy too. And so now that we've been established for a period of time, we've already started making the transition to being the business development guy solely or being more of a big picture structural and, you know, creating structures for fulfillment type of individuals, or, you know, this person now, you know, has the time to focus on operational excellence, or this person has more time to focus on, you know, growing specifically our white label partner program, you know, little things like that. Um, that provides both some level of KPI performance um, as well as, you know, you know, support on how to reach those goals. 
but there's clear delineation for everyone that's growing the overall nut and the overall growth of the company. Those are tough, tough conversations, but you know, really it's understanding everyone's strengths and then trying to maximize those strengths and reduce that mark, reduce the risk associated with each partner as well. Yeah. And, you know, for your company, you've won some fast growing awards. You won some great places to work awards. What do you, you mentioned culture. What are things that you do um, to maintain that culture for you and the team? I mean, I, great example yesterday, um, <clears throat> literally yesterday at 4.30, um, you know, because we are we work, uh, we have a little bit of a hybrid role. So we have two offices. Um, our staff comes into the office about two to three times a week. Other times they work from home. But we have two offices, one in Atlanta, another in Charlotte. And so we always want to try to, you know, make sure that the teams know each other. Everyone's gelling. Everyone's having communications with one another. And so we do, you know, sort of happy hours, you know, online happy hours, things of that mm -hmm. nature. One with like this, the escape room is one that we did like a year ago. Um, and it was an online. Virtually? Room. Uh. During this, you know, the COVID, you know, mess that we've all been dealing with. And so. We did that a year ago. And then yesterday we did a different version of that. It was like a game show. And so we, you know, everyone who got on, you were broken out into two different teams. The teams each had a different host. And like the team that got the high, the highest number of points would win. You know, it doesn't matter the points that you got. It's really just, you know, having that experience collectively. Um, and that's what we did, you know, and that was you know, just a great time, you know, earlier in the year or I guess about two, three months ago, we did a summit where we brought our entire team to one location. You know, everybody went to the battery here in Atlanta, you know, great food, went to the baseball game, just little things like that. Those investments really does add both to culture um, as well as to, you um, as well as to just, you know, building a happy team. But that those are some of the more nice things. The, there's two other really critical things that I do want to mention from a cultural perspective that is vital to your team. Um, the, the first is there being clear delineation of what someone's role is. There are going to be times when someone has to go above and beyond their existing role, and that's that's OK, but they still have to know what their daily executables are, because if they don't, then they don't have cl clear line of sight into what their future growth is at the company. Like, OK, well, if I'm mastering all of these, then what's the next thing? But if they don't even know what to master, then how can you expect for them to, to grow the way that you expect? Your expectations are off, their expectations are off, and nothing's working. And so that's the first thing I'll say. The second thing is they everyone there needs to feel supported. Um, I've learned over this period of time that you can't expect for everybody to be you. Like not everybody is you, and that's not fair for you to put you on everyone else. Everyone has their own talents and their own tiers of value that they bring to the company. And so you need your job is to figure out what those strengths are and then provide that blanket of support, whether it's education, whether it's daily check ins or weekly check ins, whether it's, you know, having, you know, office hours where folks can just ask questions, you constantly reminding people that you are an open book, don't feel like I'm going to fire you if if you ask me a question that you feel embarrassed about, like having that sort of relationship gives you, you know, the space for folks to feel like they are coming to you, you know, you know, as a family and less of as I'm just another number here and you're not really supporting me. You haven't given me clear line of sight into my roles and responsibilities. I just feel like I'm just doing stuff rather than something that's really making a difference for the, for not just the company, but ultimately the clients. Thank you for going into that highly valuable, especially in this virtual world. Those are things people can take home. Uh, Justin, last question, and before I ask it, I just want to point people online to check out Propellant.media, which is your website. It's P-R-O-P-E-L-L-A-N-T.media. Are there any other places online that we should point people towards, or is that the best place? No, nah, I mean, if, if anyone wanted to check us out, you just go to Propellant.media. So. And then you'll be geofenced and retargeted all over the internet. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you probably, no, you definitely will. Um, you, <laughs> you might even see one of our TV spots. Um, Nice. Or warm. Um, but I love it. All value though. All value. Yeah, of course. Um, what's been last question is what's been a high point? I mean, you've been running this company for a long time. 
Um, you have a great team, clients. What's been a high point for you in the journey? Um, you know, the high point, you know, we, it's, we, we, we are uh, sort of an eight, call it an eight figure agency, I guess. So that's been a one high point, which has been pretty exciting um, because it's not easy to get to that in just a five year time frame. So that that's been pretty cool, but, you know, more importantly, it's, it's really been the growth that I've seen, you know, you know, not so much just myself, but everyone within the company um, that just, that wants to become that, master of digital marketing, you know, and, you know, having that foundation and just seeing the growth that everyone is experiencing, um, the impact that it's having on people's lives, um, you know, you know, both financially, um, as well as culturally, you know, within the company. I mean, I know it sounds kind of bland, but, you know, the, you know, I'm a simple guy. Um, and for me, the simple things in life um, around building wealth and building, you know, relationships and, you know, having time off that you can spend with your family and, you know, with your friends, you know, those little things really does go a long way. Um, and, you know, for me, that's, that's, that's really the name of the game. That's what we're all trying to do here. Um, and to see that, you know, myself, my partners, um, the senior leadership here at Propellant Media, that we've been able to, you know, build an organization in a very short time frame that helps espouse those ideals um, has been pretty cool. Um, so for me, that's that's really the the highlight for us and seeing kind of what that looks like in the next three to five years. Justin, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you, everyone. Check out Propellant.media. Check out more episodes of InspiredInsider.com and Rise Twenty Five. Thanks, Justin. Man, appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand